Good, good afternoon and uh, welcome everyone to today's Alaska Collaborative on Health and the Environment webinar. Uh, this installment is entitled <clears throat> Mercury, Fish and Public Health Concerns Associated with the Proposed Donalyn Gold Mine. Uh, my name's Nick Reardon and on behalf of Alaska Community Action on Toxics, I'll be hosting today's webinar. And so I'm calling in from Anchorage, Alaska today. I'm actually uh, in, in my parents' house um, in, their, in their den. Um, and so as this is part of South Central Alaska and um, it's the traditional and unceded lands of the Denina people. And so I'd like to acknowledge and thank the stewards of this incredible place and invite you all to kind of do the same for the many places all of you are calling in from and call home. Uh, for those of you new to the gatherings, these Che Alaska, it's a regional partner of a, a national collaborative on health and environment organization, um, hence the abbreviation of CAG, Che. And so together, Che and Che Alaska, we're working to advance knowledge as well as action around the growing concerns associated with links between human health and uh, a variety of environmental factors. So you can learn more about these issues and the programs uh, that we run at our respective websites, um, akaction.org or healthandenvironment.org. Oh, was somebody chiming in there? No, it's just me. The, so this session is a little unique uh, in that we scheduled it over the Alaskan lunch hour. Um, and so apologies to those calling in from East. Um, this might be a long, busy day, um, but thanks to everyone for making time to join us. Um, it's also a little bit unique in that we're, um, that it wouldn't have been possible without help from the Center for Science in Public Participation and the Northern Alaska Environmental Center. So we're really grateful for the, the help of those organizations and other individuals um, who helped get this off the ground. So with three speakers joining us today, we have a little extra time um, and we'll break it up with, about, uh, with three different presentations followed by some Q&A and discussion. And you can type questions in using the Q&A button located at the bottom of your screen. So on to the, the reason we're all here today. We're joined by, uh, in the order they'll be presenting, Dr. Uh, Kendra Zamzow, who will be presenting on the technical aspects of mercury release from mines and, and the bioaccumulation fish populations and the problems that pose. And yeah, Dr. Samsa works for the Center for Science and Public Participation, um, specializing in microbial interactions with trace metals, acid rock drainage, and, uh, and water quality. She said in development of the Donald Environmental Impact Statement and uh, was also on the DEC working group to provide advice on update water regulations to take into consideration the actual amounts of fish consumed by people in Alaska. Our second speaker will be uh, Dr. David Carpenter to present on the human health impact associated with mercury. So Dr. Carpenter is the Director of the Institute for Health and the Environment at the University of Albany and Professor of Environmental Health Sciences um, at their School of Public Health, where he specializes in the human health effects of environmental contaminants, including health and organic cons. And our final speaker will be Gloria Simeon, ONC is a co and the board director of Conquistiquim Health Corporation. That's the region where the, the Donalyn Gold, proposed Donalyn Gold Mine is located, and, uh, and was a delegate to the National Congress of American Indians in 2019. She's been heavily involved in the opposition of the Pebble Donalyn Gold Mines here in Alaska, and uh, leading many efforts to oppose and really more thoroughly consider the consequences of that type of mining in the YK region. So yeah, welcome to all of you. And yeah, thanks so much for joining us here today. Um, yeah, and I'll invite Kendra if you wanna to take it away um, and share your screen. Everyone see my screen? Sorry, can people see? It looks good. Okay, great, thank you. Uh, so, uh, Wally Chang, Kendra Zamza, Suzette Delan, Satana, Nanette Kishna, Ekita, Nick Dini Ana, Ista, 
Uh, oops, going to ask. Um, my name is uh, good day. My name is Kendra Zamzo. I uh, live and work on Matanuska River land. I live in the town. myself uh, in their language to show appreciation for their past, present, and uh, future stewardship of I want to speak today about where the mercury comes from. Hold on. I'm, I'm seeing, I'm trying to get rid of uh, An area of where the mercury comes from, where the mercury goes, and a little bit about mercury and fish. And my background on this is that I spent um, several years working with Chihuahua Traditional Council as they reviewed and commented on the environmental impact statement for the Donlin mine as it was being written. So uh, that's where my understanding uh, comes from. So the first It, as the rocks themselves were being formed, the gold, the mercury, other elements, arsenic and so forth, all got now, they all were kind of glommed in together. And to get the gold, this means that the rock needs to be crushed and it needs to be heated. Because this is the first time a mine in Alaska will be heating the rock. And when you heat it, it causes mountain mines in Alaska, all the gold panning, all the placer mining, the Fort Knox mine, all of these, none of them have had to heat rock to get the gold out. So this is this is a really important distinction. Uh, of Donlin um, as opposed to any other mine in Alaska. This has a, a, a Twin Creeks mine in Nevada. It also has this kind of ore where the gold and the mercury are bound together in a way that it needs to be. Uh, and above the circle in that great big orange blob is the holding pond that is their what they call a tailings facility. You get a little bit of gold at the end and you get a uh, mill waste and it comes out in a slurry a very finely ground rock and uh, liquid that's water and chemicals and so forth and this is all the slurry all goes into this holding pond. So the numbers I'm showing here are Uh, bound up in the rock that enters the processing plant. And of that, about half, they expect to go out in the mill waste. Get particles or entrained in the liquid. And another 11 tons per year and another six tons will Um, as, as the vapors of mercury come up, they will condense it and it will, it will cool it, condense it. Um, and they'll store that in these metal flasks. In another part of the processing plant, the mercury will accumulate on screens. off-site. Uh, and I hope if people are saying things in the chat or the q and I actually can't see that while I'm doing my slides. So in the tailings facility, um, it really goes down the river and in the air. So And material is expected to be put on river barges 
They'll be pushed by a tugboat down the Cuscoquim River to Bethel, which I believe they'll be transferred to an ocean barge and go down to the from down the to the uh, mouth of the Cuscoquim River into the ocean, and then we're told it's none. A little bit, I think it is our concern because there is no storage place for this material. There is storage for military mercury. There will be sites in industry. As far as I know, it has not been built yet. You can't export it. That's now a law. That's what they used to do is they would send it And as best I can find out, uh, my best guess is it will go to Pennsylvania, where there is a company that will essentially Once it's in that stable form, there are places in Quebec and Canada that will store it forever. So Donlin is not going to stay at Donlin, and uh, other people, you know, could potentially be impacted as mercury is transported in these these different. So and processing goes into place is they can't capture all of the mercury, and so they estimate about. If they expect to capture over 99%, and this is what occurs in Nevada, so that's it's reasonable, but it's not 100%. Uh, and then another eight of our year. And the mine may go for 25 years, 30 years, it could be more than one mine. Um, to put it into context, it, it's not a lot. Uh, it's a lot compared to what Alaska industry releases into the atmosphere right now. I looked at the toxic release inventory that the EPA total has been released by industry in Alaska to the atmosphere. So that's maybe about four pounds per year. So this is a significant increase. Um, but Donlin is not the only source of mercury. So there are other sources. Some of them are natural. Some are uh, old. Probably into streams. Wildfire is a huge source. And the National Science Foundation estimates about two metric tons of mercury is released. as climate change uh, advances. Longer, drier periods, uh, drying that goes deeper into the soil, and more lightning to start more. It creates more wetlands and releases more dissolved carbon, which uh, we'll see in another slide, are contributing factors to uh, mercury toxicity. on the Yukon River is expected to significantly impact fish in the next 20 or 30 years and really increase the amount of mercury in them. This term methylation, mercury comes in a lot of different forms. It's a gaseous form, it's a liquid form, it's a solid form, and one form and tissue. This happens through microbial processes, natural microbes, mostly who live in wetlands and slow moving water, mucky. But for this process to happen, it doesn't happen much in oxygenated, tumbling mountain type stream environments or on glaciers, mountain.
it ha mercury not only has to go up into the air, it has to come back down, it has to enter certain environments for the mercury to get into this sort of toxic form. Those orange boxes are the mining claims uh, at the Donlin area. So that's their mining area. The pink is wetlands in the So what we see is that there are a lot of these wetland environments, which is concerning. And we don't know how much of the mercury that is released from the Donlin processing plant will actually fall back onto these wetlands. It may go up, most of it may go up, circle the globe a couple of times and come down in Toronto. You know, we have no idea. What we do know is it's increasing the load. And we also know that no matter where the mercury is sourced, if it comes down in this area, these wetlands will contribute to making the mercury into this toxic form. There is an area where mercury is methylating for a long time to accumulate it because they will excrete it at a certain rate. And you need, it's a balance of how much is accumulating, how much is coming in, how much is going out. So how much accumulates in total in that balance. One way that you can accumulate taking on that body burden as well. And that's called biomagnification. And that's related to how high you are on the food chain, how many steps in the food chain. Or cows or caribou or muskox to have any high mercury because they have one step. They eat plants, that's all they eat. Um, it's important because even though salmon are a predatory fish, they don't stay in one place, they move around. So if they're in a hot spot for a week, then they may go upstream or out to the ocean and they may be able to excrete um, faster than they accumulate. So with those in mind, we've seen in Alaska, that there are certain kinds of fish that tend to accumulate. And that is things like pike, northern pike, uh, and pike and burbot in particular around the Cusquim can have elevated mercury concentrations. Then the last step, by scavengers like foxes or seagulls, how much are they eating? So how much again is coming in versus how much is being excreted? What are uh, grams per day, GPD is grams per day. I'm sorry, I didn't put that in ounces. Um, it, they say in West, is what people in general eat. And obviously that's gonna vary a lot. Uh, other fish, about 70 grams per day. And of the high mercury type fish, as well, if, they're, if that's being traded and bartered from the coast uh, up to the middle or upper Cuscoquim. So this matters because industry based on what they think is a safe amount of mercury to be in the water, in the air, in fish tissue, and so forth. And they said advisory Right now, EPA has assumes that the nation um, eats about 17 grams of fish per day. So if you're nationally, they're looking at people eat can tuna, they eat shrimp cocktails, they eat fish sticks, but that's not the reality of tribes and especially not tribes in Alaska. So tribes uh, in Washington, Oregon, Alaska, Florida, other places have pushed the EPA Burb does become very important and Alaska has started this process but it, it went on hold during the Dunleavy administration and uh, it really needs to be picked back. Uh, will then change. It does not stop or change 
the natural sources, which again could increase with um, climate change. There are a lot of sources of mercury. Dalin will add significantly relative to other industry in Alaska, but possibly not significantly. Just where it's released, it deposits, it gets on, it deposits on the right type of environment and fish enter that environment for either a long enough time or eat other fish that have been in those environments. Uh, and this occurs in a few species uh, and there's a lot of species it does not occur in. So, Hey Kendra, uh, this is Margaret. Um, there are a few questions in the chat that may be um, uh, better to answer now. Um, so you had said that there's missing there's missing two tons of mercury. Uh, where is that going? And then the second question was, uh, where does Nevada store their captured HG? And if mercury can be clean through contaminated and not in its natural state. Yeah, uh, so um, I for the two missing uh, um, and 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 I think there's really kind of a range of what we would expect. So, but I think those are the main, well, actually some of, some of that two tons is actually from other equipment um, that would mostly end up in the flask. So I think most of that would end up in the flasks, that missing two tons. Um, for the Nevada mines, my understanding is that some of them have created their own hazmat sites at the mine. And so those are EPA um, approved hazmat sites and you can't, you can't do that. At uh, and, and I think some of those mines in Nevada are hoping it's a temporary storage until the Texas site opens up. Uh, I'm not positive on that. These mines between Nevada and potentially Alaska, even just what's at Nevada, there is so much mercury that comes out that the world for, than anyone has used for in electronics or in these other ways that mercury yeah. is used. So I think there were a couple other questions. Oh, I see one. Um, does it mean they will dump it anywhere uh, and burden other countries? They can't. It's it's illegal to export it. This is what they used to do. Uh, and, and then a law went into effect um, that says they can no longer do that. So that, that's why they're in this bind. Uh, so no, it, it will not go out overseas. And this is such a big amount that I don't... Uh, I don't see them sneaking it off in a hurt. I don't know. Uh, we do have information on how much is in certain fish in certain regions of the Cuspid Quim, and I've made those documents. Um, um, are we discussing hair levels, hair mercury levels in Alaska? Uh, I don't know, but that that's super important. What's really happening is to measure it. Measure what's in the water, measure what's in the fish tissue, take hair samples and measure what's in hair. And that's the only way you're gonna know. We have just one more we question. Should... We just have one more question okay. in the, the Q&A. And um, it says, hi, Kendra, I would like to know how the community is responding to this potential mercury pollution through the air and through food. Is there a resistance to operation for the mine? And when are they projected to start mining? 
Yeah, and I think Gloria would be a better person to answer that. There is certainly uh, a mix. Um, and I don't know how widespread the information on mercury actually is, but I think Gloria could answer that a lot better. The mine, I think, had hoped to be in operation by now. There's actually a little bit of a hiccup in their permits. Um, so we don't know. And some of this will be decided. There's boring and a lot of PR work. And then the other is a major mining, global mining company. They're really going to be the deciders if, if it... it to market. There's, there, they have to put in a 300 mile long pipeline. There's a, a lot of stuff that has to go on. And so this barrack, uh, the major on, on the cost versus actually getting it off the ground in their pocket. So uh, we're not sure when it will actually start. And I think we should go to other panelists now. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes, we should move, move on. I think David is next. Thank you. Thank you, Kendra. We'll have more time to answer. Can you see my screen? Yes, we can see your screen and it is in present mode. Thank you. Good. Okay. Introduction to that. There are three major forms of mercury. <clears throat> uh, the elemental mercury is the form that most of the mercury elemental mercury is heated, it volatilizes quite easily. And remember elemental mercury, are, that's what used to be in thermometers, that gray metal that forms little balls that rolls around on the floor. It's a very dangerous form of mercury. Actually, all forms of mercury are dangerous. But this go directly into the brain where it has toxic actions. Now, inorganic mercury, ionized mercury, uh, is all toxic to the brain, unless you put it into the brain, but it's very toxic to the kidney. And then, as Kendra said, microorganisms convert both the elemental and the inorganic mercury into these organic mercury species, the most common one. They're not formed by the fish. They're formed by the microorganisms, the algae and even the bacteria that live in uh, the uh, aqueous solutions. So just to show diagrammatically, mercury is released from uh, power plants, from forest fires, from whatever. A lot of it goes into the air. It also can be released uh, through land and water gets into a body of water where there is poor oxygenation. And the, the elemental and inorganic mercury are turned into these organic forms of mercury. And the organic forms are particularly dangerous because they cross the blood brain barrier, accumulate in the brain and can cause major damage there. Now I should say it isn't fat soluble. It binds to proteins. That's why it accumulates in tissues like the kidney, also the liver. Uh, and it can bind to proteins throughout the body and cause interference with normal metabolism everywhere. Now, 
but it accumulates. So it's it starts in the water, it gets picked up by these little microorganisms, and they methylate. All ones get eaten by little fish, and the little fish get eaten by bigger fish, and the bigger fish get eaten by even bigger fish, and then we eat the big fish. So when it concentrates by up to many thousand fold, a hundred thousand time uh, from what is actually in the water to what can get into a human. Now, if you eat a contaminated fish, you are very good at absorbing all the mercury that's in that fish. Uh, as I said, it binds to proteins. And uh, the organic forms are 10 times more. The developing nervous system is the most sensitive to low doses of methylmercury or other organic mercuries. However, I'll go in to show you that it's not only uh, infants and, and young children that are, are poison. We've had several major episodes in Minamata, Japan. Very ill, especially babies were born with cerebral palsy-like symptoms, severe brain damage, mental retardation, developmental delays. And it took a long time before people found out the cause, and that was that the uh, that even the cats were dancing, which is to say, the cats ate the contaminated fish, and their equilibrium was uh, disturbed. So, it's seventies. Methylmercury, because it's so toxic, is sometimes or was used to treat seed so that it wouldn't be uh, It was sent to a rock for the purpose of growing plants. But the people were hungry and they didn't realize it was dangerous and they ate the contaminated bread. And of six and a half thousand and again we saw these same problems of severe cerebral palsy like symptoms and neurologic problems in the children now there's been an increasing understanding of how toxic mercury is and this is just a plot over time from the 70s to 2000 and you see that the food and drug administration the world health organization the Agency for Toxic Substances and Disease Registry and EPA, they are continually over time setting standards for lower exposures because of the toxicity of mercury. This is a study done of children that are exposed to uh, 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 methylmercury. This is from the Faroe Islands. And the higher the bar, the more disabled the child. So. The children with high levels of methylmercury had deficits in motor function. They couldn't pay attention. And if you can't pay attention, how can you learn? Their visual, spatial, language, and memory functions were dramatically reduced as compared to children that had low levels of methylmercury exposure. So this is not something to take lightly. Now, uh, in this country, there has there's historically been differences between the Food and Drug Administration, the standards they set for mercury in food, and the EPA, which has no food requirements, but does provide advice to sports fishers and, and the people uh, collecting fish. But in 2000, they got together and they concluded that children of women that eat a lot of fish in seafood when they're pregnant are the population of greatest danger of being exposed. And they, they said that, you know, while the exposure to most people is not so great, those people that eat a lot of fish have very little margin of safety, particularly high-end consumers. And as Kendra said, it isn't all fish, but it is big carnivorous fish. And EPA has actually given advice 
against eating four, ever eating four species of marine fish, including swordfish, shark, tilefish, and king mackerel. Uh, but there are a lot of other fish that have mercury as well. So uh, the uh, 90th percentile of methyl mercury was 6.2 micrograms per liter. And then when they looked in people, they found that eight to 10% of women of childbearing age had blood mercury concentrations greater than this quote safe amount. And that results in something between 300 patients. Now, uh, EPA also gives these kinds of tables. It says, you know, how much methylmercury is in the fish. Water, or you go to the supermarket and buy a fish, it does not come with the label of how much methylmercury is there. So the consumer is really caught in a bind. And what is not. Uh, knowing the species is very important, but more than that, uh, it's vegetarian fish are much less likely to be contaminated than carnivorous fish. And the bigger the fish, the more likely it is going to have high mercury levels. So uh, as I mentioned, some fish should never be eaten, especially by women of reproductive age. Now, but it isn't only children that are harmed. And this is why this is important for everybody. Uh, the, the, uh, fish consumption is often considered to be very healthy by people. And there are a lot of people often, and many of them have suffered significantly. This was a study uh, 20 years ago, but it looked at people in California that ate more than two meals. And PA value of concern. And those people suffered from memory loss. They had tremors. They had tingling. And the children were born to those mothers that ate a lot of fish uh, had extra symptoms. Now, I'm not going to read all of this, but this is a monitor that ate a lot of fish, uh, lawyers and uh, salesmen, guitar players, anthropologists and the 10 year old consumed elevations in mercury. They had cognitive effects, their hair fall out. They couldn't sleep at night. So this in their mercury is to establish health protective exposure limits for people and for wildlife. But again, the problem is how do you enforce those limits, particularly to reduce mercury emissions. And this is why this issue of the gold mine is so important. <clears throat> there also needs to be communication so that people have uh, elevated mercury. Uh, and then, of course, reducing mercury in products, they are still used in medical devices and electric smith containing waste, which again, uh, Deidre did address. So in summary, mercury, when it's methylated, is a very So it comes with gold and arsenic and other uh, potentially dangerous chemicals, but the mercury that's released when it's heated travels everywhere. But uh, it can travel across the globe because the mercury is in the air. Uh, there's going to be a mass. I'd argue, well, is it massive relative to what you get from forest fires? No, but it's it's something that's controllable. Uh, the mercury that's going to be released will be formed on closure of the mine. And uh, 
the microorganisms in those bodies of water are going to convert the elemental result in contamination of local fish to a degree beyond which they are uh, contaminated. And uh, that does So uh, in summary, methylmercury is not something that uh, we should take lightly. It has serious adverse health effects. Uh, thank you for your attention. And answer the, the questions at the end. Thank you, Gloria. Thank you, David. Liana, Huinga, Alabachuk, Jalislu, Jangak. Palaja Dangme Kaufman Banya Banik. I'm sorry, I'm I'm Monkly Slohiunga. Good afternoon, my name is Gloria Simeon. My Yupik names are all about you can join. Ed, Edward Hoffman and his wife, Halaja Tangmik. I am from the native village of Monkley's Look. To participate in this panel. And with my introduction, I, I'd like to add that I am my river. running through and nourishing the land and all life is as vital to me I am the river from the headwaters to the mouth the people of the river are in my blood on the land. Everything we did and do is related to the river and the tide and the sea. Supplemented by other fish that dwell and migrate in our waters. The river as well as the land are essential for sustaining the food and resources we depend on. The proposed open pit Donlin mine and all it will bring will depend on it for life. Research done by the Health Corporation has proved conclusively that the health and up to our customary and traditional food sources not only access, but trust that the environment is healthy and the with climate change being unpredictable, leaving the land, water and air vulnerable in a way we never imagined, we cannot a river and a people. This is our land. This is where we belong. Any single failure of the insurances that have been given that have no more substance than smoke and mirrors. As it was mentioned before, climate change has brought so much unpredictability with the land and the air and the weather.
these in these past 10, 15 years. Our, our land is our home. We do not thrive in cities hunting in stores for sustenance and eating welfare food. There are rituals and ceremonies that are observed to show our gratitude to our creator and the universe for all that is given and sustains. Well, it's rites of passage for our young and their contributions to our family's food security. The first salmon of the season. Food held. Those rituals are done in honor of the gifts that we are provided. I don't have that same relationship with a big man. from the first king coming up the river or a bowl of aguruk. I trust the food I get from the land and the river. As resource development in this region or anywhere else for that matter is someplace where we don't need to go. that has experienced such lows, low water and the potential to the coast, to, to, the, to the sides of the river. How many, how many barges a day we cannot Even one, one failure of a barge, any one failure of any of these small in this region, we have the highest birth rate in the state, and we just heard. Think of the cumulative effects on the bodies of the young women that are going to be bearing these babies. That's a two generational effect. We already have so many health disparities. We can't risk more. There is already naturally a The cumulative effect of that is already part of the equation. We can't risk adding more. Our, the state of Alaska cannot be trusted to enforce even their own regulations to monitor these mines. For that Donlin is going to be here at the time of any kind of catastrophic failure. There isn't even enough failure, a failure occur, and we cannot feed ourselves. There are just too, too many. Uh, a, a tour of the Elko mine down in Nevada in 2015. It scared me. what had been done to the land and what they were planning on bringing to my home. For us to thrive and survive, we have to have trust and know that everything 
occurred for the children, for our grandchildren, no matter where they are, so that they always have a place Don't have to shop for welfare food or depend on a handout because our fishes are in there. And I'd like to say, uh, in response to the one. by our region that supported uh, the mine if it was done in an in Our tribe and other tribes were able to pull that resolution, that 06 resolution in 2019. September, we pulled that resolution and we introduced a new resolution opposing mine, and that was passed by the villages of our region. We are in opposition of the Donlin mine. Um, I think in the chat, and if anybody has any other questions, uh, feel free to to add them. Um, the one um, is is that um, and I think it's been answered in the chat. Kendra actually answered it, but there are. Mercury, this is from Jen Jennifer Hanlon. Uh, mercury levels in humans, and is it is is that as simple as providing a hair sample? The mercury can be analyzed in a whole variety of tissues. Uh, as I said, they. But you can also uh, measure mercury in blood. Uh, but the advantage of hair and nails is that uh, and it's an easy way to get a, a measure of exposure of mercury over long periods of time. If you have long hair, you can cut it in pieces and determine how much exposure. Yeah, and um, in the chat, uh, Sarah Yoder uh, responded that the state hair And also, um, I'm not sure who in Alaska not sure. I would talk to uh, DEC has a fish tissue monitoring program and you would want to contact them. In that program and they could tell you what labs. In addition, the uh, Yukon Cuscoquim Health Corporation is also And down the river. So there's there's that. Thank you.
response? Oh, yes, I was on mute. I'm so sorry. Um, so Mark <laughs> Stifelman had to do, um, asked a, a question. He with the risks from uh, mercury exposure, particularly for communities that must rely on subsistence. Um, it was answered in the chat, I realized. Uh, reiterate that. Yeah, it's so good. Um, and and trying to get fish tissue uh, or or people or actual samples from people tested in your. are accumulating that it actually gets a little bit more complicated because there's work now that's still kind of ongoing but where species not tell you it may actually be less toxic uh, if there is also selenium being accumulated so it, it can get kind of complicated but in general tend to be elevated um, and then limit your consumption of those species. Um, and since they tend to lose all the birds, uh, all of these other subsistence resources are all going to be very low in mercury. So it's just kind of understanding Uh, eating subsistence foods. Um, salmon in particular, we know is going to be low. Shanna Alexander has a question. Um, have there any, been any correlation studies conducted on concentration of a comprise the majority of the protein in their diets are also are the results from the ADEC uh, fish monitoring program. I am also curious about the fish preparation practices of the Sivugak uh, Yupik people. Let's answer that. Um, it's kind of a long question. Uh, and there's like two more, three more questions. Um, first, and then we can go on to the, the next ones. Well, with the fish tissue monitoring program, I, I don't know that they're trapped. Yeah, so I think you'd have to actually contact uh, Bob Gerlach or Chris Furren at their program and see if that's something they can do. Uh, they, I, I, I don't think it would be the if there aren't enough samples over time from an area, it would be difficult to tell. Um, I think this is a question. Not this project. I th I thought I answered that by um, talking about oh. the the resolutions that were passed that yeah. the tribes of the region are against the proposed Donlin mine. I want to make sure it was answered. Um, Karen Gwynn asks, is there a home test or a way to check for merc mercury in Does anybody know? The, the fish meet to a laboratory 
it's not very realistic, however, to uh, catch a fish, send off a part, and then he said. David, thank you. Um, um, what are the most hopeful directions that you all see regarding Leah Jones, she says, great presentation from everyone, and she's uh, thankful. Oh, um, so what are the most hopeful directions that you all see regarding the opposition and or modification of this mind development? Um, and I think Gloria said no mine at all. <laughs> take to develop the infrastructure of this mine it would take a road coming from cook inlet through the mountain passes that road with runways to fly things in and out with helicopters or whatever, because they cannot truck it until what? an email with um, pictures of the kinds of trucks that they use down in Elko to haul the the waste, the mine waste. Thanks. To the to the to the piles wherever they pile it, and the tailings ponds. We are our, our Alaskan environment, the mountain ranges. Our Infrastructure development would totally, totally change life out here. And it would bring, I mean, I. People coming because they have access here we we can preserve and protect so much better yeah and i and, and i'm also on the missing and murdered indigenous people working group and i think of all the potential so the infrastructure itself would just be too much for the environment to sustain right now at a time when thank you another question would uh is and this is from an anonymous attendee uh, attendee or mercury impact do the, do the mercury impact stay in, in the Kuskokwim? Oh. and also um they ask if well, that well mrs kinder i can answer the first part and i and i think and, gloria can probably answer the second um whether it impacts the fish at Donlin relative to the other sources that are there, I don't think we know that yet. It requires testing the fish. To is whether it affects the seafood industry is a really good question because uh, I used to live in Cordova and I, when the Exxon, and I used to fish there commercially, Purity of fish had no impact. You know, if they were impacted, they mostly died. And, and fishing, there was no fishing that year in, in a lot of those areas. In Alaska, uh, as people, as the fish were not available from Prince William Sound, they started getting fish from farm fish from Chile. And Of farm fish, they could get any size they wanted, any time of year they wanted, and it permanently changed some of the market. 
and it's been a battle to bring it back. Uh, it's going to change the seafood. It may not actually impact seafood, um, but it's a matter of whether, whether that image is out there. You know, it's really hard to like those people sometimes when you have to separate the sin from the sinner. I, but I believe that Chalice, this, know what they were going to do. It was something that was cooked up between Chalista and the Cuscoquim Corporation. And I believe Chalista has to get out of it. It has come up to the board that the shareholders want to take a vote on this because the majority of the shareholders in the region. We are opposed to this mine, but it's being driven by Chalista, and I'm so glad that this uh -huh. I'm, I'm really embarrassed to say it, but they were waving that 06 resolution around like you would wave advertisements for the red light district in And they say, well, Chile no, the people do not support it. Chalista mm -hmm. is going against the will of the people. Kendra, um, I really appreciate your, your, your um, input. Um, and there is just a few more questions. And um, she's asking, what are the most hopeful directions that you all see regarding the opposition and or modification of this? Logistically, like, what can we do? I don't think we can, we can, there's, there's no negotiating here. Our land, our air and our water are non-negotiable. That's all there is to it. Thank you. Thank you, Gloria. Kendra? tax to um, uh, slow or stop the mind, but I would caution against saying too much on, on this webinar that could be viewed. Um, Thank you, Kendra. That may, um, that may not be very helpful, but... <laughs> <laughs> Um, another question is, uh, large-scale mining has always been an issue in Alaska, mm -hmm. especially along the Mercury Belt, which mm -hmm. potential harms. As tribes, we can pass resolutions, but what are other measures we can take? Around the world. Uh, and the, the issue is that we use things. We buy things, we use things. Oh, corporations start building things that if we need the metals, those things will last our lifetime. And I'm not tossing out a computer every three, every three years. you know, use less, keep things longer, try to get things that don't have metals. That's, that's all we can do, either that or reduce. There is some 
deep sea mining that is um, controversial, whether that's going to be But it's it's us, it's our consumption, and that's the bottom line. Thank you, Ken. Thank you. Uh, um, that somebody had uh, mentioned, like, I think if there was um, a way to do I, I can't find it now, but it was uh, in there. They're um, trying to say that uh, is there a way we can do mining in a in a there is another question about um, uh, any studies or background levels of mercury mercury established in berries. proposed mine. Yeah, there are. And, and a lot of that information is in the final EIS. And uh, uh, as a link, they can maybe post the link to the final EIS. Um, if I recall, I'm a water person, I'm not a vegetation person, but uh, So if you had a salmon berry, it might accumulate more than in a blueberry. But uh, I would really have to look at that information. And, and again, it's, it's, not, it's just not an issue. Even if it's in the plant, um, you, your body does excrete. And, Maybe, maybe Dr. Carpenter could expand on that a little bit, but uh, uh, plants, some accumulate more than others, but um, I don't, I don't. Uh, plants aren't eating other plants and they're taking their mercury as is the case with fish. But I think the, one of the answers to the question of what have high mercury and which do not. Also, it's a general rule that smaller fish are going to have less contamination than bigger. Contaminants in fish that are of concern, pr probably not so much from wild fish, but for example, uh, species of persistent organic chemicals like PCBs. Uh, we don't see that so much in the wild fish, but uh, organic, which species are dangerous and which are not uh, is, is a very important factor. I've traveled to America and attended like the National Congress of American Indians and the National Native Events Meetings Convention. There's some sisters that have water rationing on their reservations because their water is not there anymore. There's no, there's in Nevada is to feed the rivers, to feed the dam, the rancheros, rancheras, they have for every year. They have no place to store it. And we don't want that to happen in Alaska. We don't want our rivers to be dammed. the whole system depends on being healthy at every level and we need fresh good 
clean water and air and land is. And it's the right of every living thing. That of the whole carbon footprint of every living thing on earth, 550 megatons. And we have created more devastation on this planet than 549 others. Also, we forget that we're really small in the whole big picture of things. And we Thank you. Thank you, Gloria. I, I really appreciate there to, um, There's another question, I guess. Um, they're wondering if, uh, can the Alaska Department Uh, they could. Um, there's a variety of permits that are needed. The conservation says, uh, yes, we agree that you won't contaminate uh, waters um, beyond the standards that we set. Conclusion that the mine uh, will inevitably contaminate the waters, then they could deny the permit. That's never happened. Um, certainly uh, many different agencies could say no. Uh, the Army Corps of Engineers could say no. The State Department of Natural Works. They have been very loose in the permitting that has gone so far. I have Alaska and I don't, it's gonna be up to the public to advocate for our land and resources because this, the state has not done and there. I don't know. The state is looks at, at, at things in a very short, short. So laden with resource development people that don't have to deal with the fallout, the ripple of very fancy homes in Anchorage on the hillside in the urban centers and they can shop at Fred Meyer's and cars and hunt for their food in the grocery store that is wielded in the state of Alaska and how these decisions are made. And they are not made in the best interests of the first peoples of this. Thank you. Thank you, Gloria. Um, Nick actually had a question he wanted to to ask. Um, it's of mining now versus waiting for mining in the future, um, being at the value of what will be the value of mercury in the future and that's developed a way to convert mercury back into a stable form. Uh, I think that's a great way to deal with mercury. <laughs> um, 
I, we just, we have no need. I don't anticipate, we don't have it now and I don't and see any reason why we would need generated from the gold mines that need to heat the ore and, and release it. It's nobody, nobody is mining for mercury now. Nobody is mining for Donna would love it if this was a Fort Knox that didn't have mercury with it, that didn't need to be heated. You know, this is not something they want. Um, to the pro to their project that they have to deal with. Um, and and I, I just don't see that changing. I don't see any new uses coming up from Mercury. Models, but um, I don't see it really with Mercury. The best we can hope for is these kind of technologies that can make it more stable and easier to store. Um, and it, and then I guess there's another question too. It's it's related. It, it's come up a little bit in some of the chat. Is is we do need a lot of metals. We we need a lot of gold. Um, and so maybe that's something we should look at. Is how many gold mines do we really need for certain uh, a lot. It's, I think that's a valid question. I think another reason why delaying may have some advantage percent, but that other one percent uh, with development of new technology may be even more efficient. And what's in the tailings pond so it doesn't vaporize. Um, there has been work on that. I don't know how effective it is. Uh, I know Donlin's looked at it. Uh, also um, so uh, Leah Jones asks, uh, The other metals you mentioned, uh, lithium, et cetera. Yeah, uh, yeah. Um, lithium, it's um, it, it usually doesn't even look like these big mines that you see. It's uh, it's more like groundwater well type stuff. that um yeah i don't really know of any other situation other than gold mines where you get this big amount of byproduct mercury if there's any more questions we're coming to the the end of our um our webinar here but i want to um just make sure that if there was any questions anybody And um, I just wanted to, um, I'm not seeing any, uh, oh, yes, um, I was just going to Nick will be sending out an email. Um, his his uh, audio was re was uh, cutting out, so I, I had to jump in for him. Um, so Nick will be of any additional uh, related resources that came up during our time together, uh, such as I think the one uh, Kendra had mentioned. Um, our next call study on the presence of PFAS or forever chemicals present in breast milk and potential health ha effects on infants. More details. Alaska webinars and ACAT's other efforts, uh, you can give online at akaction.org. And with any additional questions or comments, 
714. Um, I just want to say thank you again to all our panelists. Um, and I hope uh, everyone has a, a There are a number of studies that have already been done by the Yukon Kuskokwim Health Corporation in relation to mercury and its health. Person that you should be able to get copies of that research. This is public information and should be available to you as well as any other studies that have been. proposed Donlin Creek mine. So thank I'll get you, that Gloria. to you in an email. So thank you. And thank you so much. This was this was a very good platform. Near and dear to my heart. Thanks. Thank you. Yes. And uh, Gloria, we'll make sure to um Um, so that everybody here can have that information as well. Thank you. Mariana. Thank you. Thank you very much.